Hello everyone, welcome back to Spacecast and today we are going to talk about more and more interesting stuff. What is Spacecast? It is a regular podcast on space science and technology, but mostly we ended up talking about all the other technology and engineering stuff because everything influences space science and space science influences everything. So in the last few episodes, we ended up talking James Webb Space Telescope in a huge detail and majority part of it is done. Like if you go through the last two episodes, you'll understand everything about JWST, all that you need to know. But two parts were left. Number one, the propulsion part. And second one was the L2 or Lagrange point in general, which are a few things that we are going to discuss today. Apart from that, since I'm expecting those two things will be discussed in the first half an hour, we are also going to start discussing nuclear science. Like I said, we mostly end up discussing a lot of stuff apart from space science but like i said everything influences space science now there's an application of nuclear science in space industry as well one you might be knowing or might not be knowing but here it is the nuclear propulsion part it is not physically working right now but it is definitely the future of space science and uh, we are going to discuss that in detail, but we can't really get into, oh, here's nuclear propulsion first. We'll have to understand what is nuclear science, how does nuclear reactor works, and then maybe get into more and more part. Uh, now, in the last few episodes, we ended up talking about some geopolitics as well. For example, what is going on in Russia and Ukraine and uh, get used to it. Maybe I'm going to discuss it today as well. Let's see where it goes. The whole podcast is 100% unscripted, although everything that I talk about has proper research and study and a lot of times my own experience involved. And so I have all the notes with me and every now and then I refer to it because misinformation is bad and everything has to be discussed with facts, proper theories. Okay, so that's how we go. We take it both seriously and not so seriously, but at every point. It is supposed to be fun. So let's get into it one by one. I would like to start with how the propulsion of JWST works because it will also answer why JWST has a lifespan of only 10 years. And then we are going to get into the Lagrange point and why it is such an interesting point in space wherever, whenever you are having a three body system. So let's get into it one by one. So when you look at propulsion, JWST has in total of 20 thrusters. Now 16 of it are monopropellant thrusters and are mainly focused towards spinning control uh, of the telescope so that you focus it towards a particular point of interest. The entire universe is your domain. You can look at wherever you want to and to control its position or its point of view. Uh, you can use these 16 monopropellant thrusters. More about that just in a moment. The rest of the four thrusters are orbital control thrusters and these are bipropellant thrusters. These are much more powerful because orbital control will require more energy and specifically because of this, you are going to have limited amount of life because after that, you won't be able to have it in the position that it was either designed to or where you want it to be. So let's begin. JWST has 191 liters of hydrazine, that is N2H4, and 95.5 liters of N2O4. Hydrazine, you can think about it like fuel, and N2O4, you can think about it like an oxidizer. Anything with an oxygen, which is acting as a propellant in a spacecraft or any kind of propulsion involved in a spacecraft is oxidizer. All right. Now, there's something that you all must have seen at some point or the other the fire triangle, right? What does it involve? The three uh, points of fire triangle would be number one, fuel, number two, oxidizer, and number three, heat source. Now, if three happens, then you'll be having a continuous combustion. Now in space, obviously you know that there's no oxygen, you'll have to carry it with you. On earth, however, it is predominant and prevalent most of the time. So over there, you'll have to carry it with you. Now, the heat source can be any external source that is kind of like an igniter or a catalyst or it can be internal as well like a chemical reaction which creates a heat source itself so let us get into it one by one we are going to first talk about the 16 monopropellant thrusters which are used to move towards specific points of interest the reaction that is going on over here is 
monopropellant reaction single propellant will be doing all the jobs so everything is done over here by hydrazine hydrazine n2h4 is going to be added with a catalyst which is going to give a reaction as n2 some amount of it which is nitrogen gas and h2 hydrogen gas and also nh3 this reaction is exothermic and thus we get huge amount of energy which is going to cause the propulsion now how propulsion actually works i've explained this before but in the simplest form if i say it is conservation of linear momentum if you throw some mass with some velocity in let us say left direction then same momentum has to be in the right direction as well and that momentum might be imparted on the spacecraft the spacecraft might be much heavier that is the mass might be higher but then the velocity will be lower but if you throw that mass on the left side in a huge amount of velocity then the right side will get a decent amount of velocity this is conservation of linear momentum that is mv in both the sides will be constant maybe someday i'm going to explain in much more detail or i've already explained in some of the videos that i've made previously you may go ahead and check it out but this is the basic principle of propulsion some call it newton's third law but then again please explain in space what do you have to push against and some will be saying that uh, uh, the conservation of linear momentum is derived from newton's third law agreed but uh, not completely so maybe a topic of discussion for some other day now this is the reaction that you have in monopropellant you have a single propellant and on that you add catalyst and then you get an exothermic reaction this is how the 16 mon monopropellant thrusters are working to control the spin of the telescope towards the point of interest the second category of thrusters that we have over here are for orbital control and i've talked about this before the jwst has a very twisted orbit so if you look at it it is obviously orbiting the sun along with earth this is the speciality of all the lagrange points i'm going to discuss that in much more detail but at the same time it is orbiting nothing also so you can see at the screen right now how the orbit is going to look like now although lagrange point is going to be involving the least amount of energy from the spacecraft to maintain that orbit it is still going to involve some energy or the other and for that we are having orbital control i'm going to make a video very soon explaining how the this halo orbit is actually formed so what we have in uh, orbital control thrusters which are definitely stronger than the prior one is we have a monopropellant thruster but it is a kind of thruster which we call hypergolic now what does hypergolic mean hypergolic means the moment the two propellants touch each other that's the moment combustion automatically starts it does not require any external source a great example for this would be vikas engine which is the mo most like workhorse engine of all the launch vehicles of isro in PSLV, we use we use it as a second stage in PS2 and GSLV. There are five Vikas engines, GS2 and uh, four booster stages L40. And in uh, Mark III, we use it as a twin engine. So that is called the L L110 stage. So you can go through it. Through it, I've already explained these three launch vehicles before. So over there also, you are going to get a uh, hypergolic mixture, and there is no external like an igniter. On the other hand. Some cryo engines have some external igniter, uh, but the problem with those igniter is that it can fire only once. So those engines, if you want it to be restartable, then the igniter has to be reignitable. But most of these igniters just are one time go. Okay. All right. A little bit off topic, but this is the reaction that you are going to get. 2N2H4 plus N2O4 will give you nitrogen gas and water. This is a hypergolic now this has an advantage in itself because it is hypergolic there is no external igniter which means that it will reduce the number of parts and in, a, in an operation or a project which is as complex as JWST you better want to make it as simple as possible because it is already having like 300 single points of failure you don't want to want it to be like 304 single points of failure so as minimum amount of uh, parts the better and that was a great motivation for using hypergolic uh, propulsion although if you look at spacecrafts or any satellite propulsion we don't really use these high level 
propulsions because number one the amount of thrust required is less it's not like you're on the surface of earth and you're going to require tons of uh, thrust and uh, also uh, simpler the better always and also simpler the lighter always so more number of parts has to be welded maybe in some cases screwed so it involves a lot of things a lot of mess that is why solid boosters are so much easier to handle than liquid boosters because solid booster has like one tenth of the number of parts some sometimes even like one twentieth or one hundredth of the number of parts of a liquid propulsion engine okay sorry about that sometimes i knock down my mic okay so i guess i've explained everything about the propulsion part see uh the propulsion has a propulsion system hold on what was that noise it's much better now okay so the propulsion has 191 liter of hydrazine now this is the limitation now this amount of propellant is going to last only for 10 years and that is why the life of JD jwst at least on paper till now is 10 years after that it is like a historic piece floating in space 1.5 million kilometers away from earth but obviously there are plans that maybe in future we are going to develop it to the point that uh, it is going to it is we can go ahead and repair it yeah if, if you're thinking about going to mars better be good enough to go to jwst as well so it's all far fast and future man it's always like you are always going to predict it wrong <laughs> so yesterday i was watching this movie what was it blade runner blade runner 2049 and uh, if you look at how much different you look at future from today it's kind of crazy like 2049 is close enough you're going to see me doing space cast in 2049 as well if i'm alive hopefully now <laughs> it's not going to be much different so in that movie what they have tried to say or show is that there are no trees anymore the water is super scarce so if you look at the pacific ocean it's all dried up and uh, there's there's no tree there's no wood animals like dogs and cats and horses are scarcity and uh, super expensive because they are so rare no and also there are places where atom bombs have dropped now that i can live with <laughs> like it is completely understandable or feasible that atom bombs are dropped although i hope not but understandable but what i don't understand are flying cars moving like jets and then landing on the earth all of a sudden and uh, human genetics or human human what we call genetic mutation or people are putting chips on humans and making clones not really something that i see will happen in such a new, near future now if you really have to look at how much we mispredict future you just have to look out look at our past predictions for example have any one of you watched that movie trilogy back to future the funniest part about that is that that dude comes to 2015 30 years in future from 1985 and finds flying cars everywhere finding out the suits that itself adjusts to your body and dries itself and hoverboards all the places people are flying none of that happened seven years ago in 2015 and i'm thinking that it won't happen 15 years later as well we are terrible at predicting future does not really work like that so uh <laughs> if if you ask me ashish how is 2049 going to look like pretty much like this because how was 1985 looking like well people were driving cars there were airplanes people moving from one place to another flying from one place to another people were telecasting their shows on radio now people are telecasting their shows as podcast and people can watch it or listen to it throughout the world can also watch it uh, but if you look at it the core definitely looks the same for example if you look at london in in and even 1960 i know a lot of cities that do not look that well developed even till this day so you can't really say 
that we are going to develop so much and also there was another movie it is released recently on netflix project something something ryan reynolds is in that that and over there it shows that 2049 you have developed time machine huh <laughs> that also i do not know but if it was developed some say that it is developed you just don't know about it well if if it was developed you will probably know about it because people are thirsty thirsty and greedy they are going to make some technology out of it same goes same goes with all that is going on right now with russia ukraine and war going on people dying that that is what is going on people are saying oh, i'm pro this i'm pro russia i'm pro pro ukraine dude you don't know what's going on so stop pretending okay you you have a degree in engineering and you're looking for a job and you think that you know what's going on in russia ukraine you have no idea the media is so tarnished and every point you look at russian media it is completely different you look at the western media completely different you look at what's going on in india completely different all they care is about making a lot of money and who is actually paying them nobody knows how much this media is controlled by the government everybody knows but still you are going to look at the news and you go oh i think what is going on is this 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 is wrong this is. you don't know shit stop acting like you do you are never going to find out man you're ne- <laughs> you are you are not that important to know what is actually happening you don't even know how inflation happens man you don't even know what happens when sanctions are placed i also don't know not pretend pretending that i do know but you don't know so stop saying that sanctions are good or sanctions are bad because you don't know you know nothing so you better stop giving your own opinions or trying to figure out what's going to happen and uh, you're going to see celebrities trying to post stuff like this for that that I'm I'm with that my heart goes to this nobody knows what's going on man i heard couple of podcasters who are comedians by profession talking about russia ukraine crisis and they did not know the full form of nato <laughs> so i know more than that but i still do not know anything what is going on so definitely they need to shut up and also i've been following this whole russia ukraine for the past one month now close to that when nobody was talking about it matter of fact i've been following it for over a year go to talk and fire podcast and we have talked about it in 2021 Uh, what's going on and what has happened in tw- 2014 and uh, at that time like in mid of february a little bit earlier than that like close to 10th or 11th february i was just thinking like why is it not mainstream why is not why isn't everyone talking about it and now <laughs> everyone is talking about it man everyone every podcast is talking about it everyone is trying to give his or her own opinion like what's going on hey man here you go this is what is actually happening hmm great you make clickbaits on youtube and you know what's exactly happening hmm good i should trust the one who who is making clickbaits so for for a time being this was the running clickbait is russia going to use nuclear weapons and everyone everyone is making is it is it is it and all they are doing is is it going to use nuclear weapons that's the thumbnail for every video and then what they are going to do is bring some like military expert and is it going to, it might but it might not either oh good dude like i did not know that it might and might not so why did you make a clickbait <laughs> so <laughs> this is what they are doing and you know what's the recent one is russia going to use chemical weapons and then he they are going, going to put in thumbnail is russia going to use chemical weapons what putin is thinking and then they are going to bring some xyz military expert it might but it might not either oh nice man so all that i have done for the past 3 3 to 4 days is not interested not interested all the videos recommended when it comes to russia ukraine not interested not interested not interested before putin invaded ukraine it was still like balanced kind of news like we don't know we do not have a stance now every news channel has a stance either i'm pro putin i'm against putin i'm pro ukraine i'm against ukraine and nobody is going to say anything like that but their content says everything that a particular news channel is going to talk about all the good things that ukraine are doing ukraine is doing and none of the bad things that might be there and the second 
another news channel will be talking about all the good things Russia is doing, none of the bad things. So you don't know. That's the conclusion that I've gotten to. And neither do you control anything that is going on over there. The best that you can do is find a charity that is actually going to send money to the people uh, who are devastated or whose lives are devastated. And that's the only thing for certain. Like people's life are wrecked. Think about an entire country with all their employment and life gone. What are they going to do? And for what? Again, coming back to the greed. This is greed game, man. Everything is greed game. Ego clashes. And countries thinking about what is good for them. And worst part is that the top politicians thinking about what is the best thing for them. Rich people don't die in wars, man. It's poor people dying in wars because of rich people's ego or greed. That's what always happens. So if a politician walks up and says that, oh, I should start a war for my country. Dude, if you win that war, you are going to get a lot out of it. If you lose that war, you're not going to die. So it's a kind of okay, okay situation for you either way. So it does not matter for you. And we go behind those people like, crazy blind ones so that's that's what i wanted to say I do not know where i got into it but sometimes we do like i said in the beginning as well sometimes we do and sometimes we should accept that we don't know all right now coming back to the propulsion of james webb space telescope which was actually covered 100 percent now i want to get into l2 point what a contrast of topics once we are going to talk about the stuff that is going online and then the next one we are going to talk about the l2 orbit now, what are Lagrange points? So, to understand it in the best way possible, what you need to know over here is that there are two kind of forces in play. Number one, the centrifugal force, and number two, the gravitational force. So, if a body is orbiting around another celestial body, so it has some centrifugal force which will toss it outside so that it can spiral its way out to the point that it is in a different trajectory. Or, if the gravitational force is too strong, it is going to spiral its way in. For example, the satellites, which will lose its propulsion over time is going to crash into the earth and atmosphere will cause its drag force, force and a lot of times it will burn out. That was another thing that was going on with the Russia-Ukraine thing, man. So so Russia, uh, Russia says that or its head of space program, that is Roscosmos, says that we are not going to help in bringing that one astronaut which is in space right now in ISS. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, American astronauts were launched to ISS using the Soyuz launch vehicle, which is a fantastic launch vehicle when it comes to launching humans into the space. It is having a, what we call a flawless track record. It has never failed. It has never killed a person. So... That same uh, Soyuz capsules will be there, kind of like live boards in ISS. And you sit on that and over time it circles its way in and lands on land. That is how Soyuz is designed. So I'm thinking that it is going to ultimately land into Russian soil. <laughs> and now the beef between America and Russia, they're saying that NASA scientists are not going to be helped. And then, where the hell is Elon Musk when you need him? Well, he's right here. So, <laughs> he says that I'm going to bring him back. Okay. Uh, so, that's what's going on. So, actually, there's one astronaut, Scott Kelly. I know him because he was probably on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. He said something like this, like, you, you people working in Roscosmos uh, will be needing new jobs very soon. Maybe you will need to get jobs in McDonald's if McDonald's still works in Russia. <laughs> like full on, full on anti-Russia, right? Think about think about the hate Russian people would be getting. People are just making it more plural than it is. Think about what Russian people are getting as hate in in America right now. Think about how an entire population or class of people or set of people nationality is hated just because of a freaking war we were all good man we we're all fine but all of a sudden people hate each other russians hate americans americans hate russians there were some fine indian kids my brothers in russia ukraine border 
uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, Poland border, border, and uh, they were said that oh, why should we, uh, why should we help you guys if your country is not going to help us, something like that. Dude, he didn't do anything. What the hell? This is racism. This is what war brings. It brings racism. So stay away from war. But then again, neither me, I can do anything, nor you can. Okay, hopefully, hopefully there will be a day where people will not be such numb nuts, man. Okay, so coming back to the point again to the L2 orbit. <laughs> Every now and then we are going to try. So there are basically two different forces. What are they? Hopefully the whole current situation helped you understand that there are two forces. One, gravitational force, and the second one is centrifugal force. Now, L2 points are points of balances. So over here, there will be a crystal clear balance between the two forces. And there are not a lot of points which are having this fine balance, but they are in total L1, L2, yeah, five such places. So if you look at two different bodies, any two different celestial body, which is having gravitational connection in between each other, and one is orbiting the other, then you are going to get these five points. So L1, L2, and L3 are on one straight line, the visual is shown to you on the screen over here. L2, as you can see, is the farthest away from Sun. Even if you look at L3, L3 is at the same distance from Sun as Earth is. And by the way, any two bodies, for example, Sun and Jupiter has the same number of Lagrange points, that is five. That is also very interesting. I'm going to expand more over there. And then L4 and L5 are also not the farthest away they are like kind of close okay so what we have over here is that these five points are not going to change its position with respect to earth and sun so if you look at it all these five points are going to move simultaneously so even if l4 l3 and l5 are not having anything at that place that point you can think about will be uh, orbiting around the sun just as earth is orbiting and the angular distance angular difference between l4 and earth is not going to change and angular distance between l5 and earth is not going to change and L2, L3, and L1 are, and Earth are always going to remain in the same straight line. So that's amazing because the relative distances are not changing. So if you place anything, any spacecraft in these points, then what is going to happen is that you do not have to worry about it cha it's changing its relative distance, right? So it is always going to be there. So if you think about a frame that is rotating around a point where sun is placed and is rotating with a uh, angular velocity that is equal that of earth like it is rotating with the earth then these all points are going to seem fixed got it so i'm going to use some visuals by some fantastic people uh, who have shown visual depiction i'm not that good in animation but i'm going to give them credit so you can see it at the bottom left part all right, so the good part about it is that relative distance uh, distances do not change. So uh, if you look at it and understand how it works, it works by the balance. And that balance you can understand if gravity is like a well and uh, the, the centrifugal forces are also working like the farther you go, the forces decrease. So what you get is kind of these mountainous places and if you place something like think about it like you placed a ball over here and if there's no external force apart from these two forces which is not going to be in the empty space then it is going to stay over there but you can think about it every now and then this ball is going to wobble or try to topple on one side or the other either towards the body which is causing the gravitational force or away and drift away because of the centrifugal force so to maintain this balance, this play, uh, you will have to use orbital propulsion. And that is the use of that bipropellant that I was talking about. So uh, this, these L Lagrange points were discovered long back. 
in the 18th century itself. First L1, L2 and L3 were discovered by Euler and L4 and L5 were discovered by Lagrange, which is, which were who were like mathematicians. There were no engineers back then. L4 and L5 uses a concept of Coriolis force, which I'm definitely not prepared to explain over here. Just for your knowledge, you might know. Now, if you look at this halo orbit, the, the radius of this halo orbit, there's no radius because it does not orbit in a circle. So what we have the planets or celestial bodies orbit in what we call an ellipse. Um, with the body around which you're orbiting at one of its, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I do not know the perfect term for it, but when you look at ellipse, there will be two important points. I think they call it focus. I'm going to put it on the screen anyway. So that was one of the Kepler's law. Someday I'm going to explain that one by one as well. So what we end up getting is a major axis and a minor axis. And in terms of like you want an analogous to radius, what we have is a semi-major axis and a semi-minor axis. So uh, this James Webb Space Telescope orbiting around nothing, which is L2, it is not exactly at L2, but it is orbiting L2 while the L2 itself is going to orbit the sun as L2 is going to move along with Earth. So this orbit, that is the orbit of JWST around L2 has its apoapsis as 832,000 kilometers and uh, periapsis as uh, 250,000 kilometers. Uh, if you look at what is the radius of Earth, it is 6,400 kilometers. So don't you think that JWST is all the time in the shadow of Earth? That would have been brilliant, by the way. It would have been much easier uh, for JWST uh, to remain cool if it is always in the shadow of earth but that is not possible over here because as you can look at it uh, it is at a much larger orbit okay but still better than being at let us say l1 uh, a sun observation spacecraft is always going to be placed at l1 because it is closest to the sun all right so is there anything that is left yeah one thing that i want to mention is if you look at the Lagrange points of Sun and Jupiter, then specifically at L4 and L5, there are a bunch of asteroids stuck over here because of this reason that Lagrange points are extremely stable. So any particle or celestial body that goes over there wants to stay over there. There is no more stable part in a two body system when a third body comes than these Lagrange points. So L4 and L5 has bunch of asteroids over there and they have actually named it as well. Uh, some of them are called Trojans. So uh, it is named after uh, the Greeks. If you look at 200, 300, 400 BC, Troy and Greece fought for a long time. So some of it is named after the Trojan legends and some of them are named after the Greek legends like uh, Achilles and all, okay? So you can just take a look if you have too much time to go through it. Now, that's all about the Lagrange point that I would like to explain over here. If you want me to explain with diagrams like in front of a board or all, you let me know, I can do that. But that's about it, about the Lagrange point, the propulsion and also the entire JWST. We did it, uh, in a stretch of close to one month because I did not want to just straight up talk about JWST for two hours, boring for me, boring for you. Don't want it, all right? Okay, now with that, if you have any more questions, I'll be more than happy to discuss it in later on Spacecast or if you have some questions which can be addressed in the comment section, go ahead, put the comments, guys. You should be doing that in other ways, even if you don't have a question do comment because it helps the podcast grow. That's all that I care about right now. I care about this podcast reaching more and more people. It's better than most of the content on YouTube because YouTube is stuffed with all the time pass content. People don't really want to learn a lot. So it's my role and your role would be to like, comment and share. Definitely, I think that you would be smart enough to subscribe, especially because you stayed over here till the 
30 minute mark now the next what we are going to do is talk about nuclear science and engineering we are going to start with absolute basics by the way that's what we do in every episode uh, we have a community and all people over there are highly enthusiastic more than i expected people put their queries their questions all scientific nothing other than that uh, their fascinations with fiction their fascinations with whatever is going on right now they put their questions before we started i started recording this session i had put one comment over there that i'm going to talk about nuclear science and engineering you have any questions you put it over there and uh, and i have gotten some questions which i'm going to address after a few minutes of discussing few of the basics of nuclear science and engineering so shall we start oh yeah if you want to be joining that community it will cost you a thousand dollars not really it is down in the comments uh, description box free link join it you're most welcome i'm pretty sure that it is going to be stuffed very soon how many people are in that group now we have 37 people you go 250 and it's done it's on whatsapp all right after that we'll have to move to discord or something like that okay now it's time for some cold coffee man it's getting hotter and hotter every day let's get into nuclear science so what is nuclear science all about let's start where it starts so we'll have to talk about history so it all started with e is equal to mc square 1905 where einstein published a paper which was talking about e is equal to mc square so what it actually says is mass and energy are interconvertible and it's convertible by a factor of a square of velocity of light that is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second and nobody really did anything practical with it now obviously there were people like Marie Curie who studied about radioactivity and there were a bunch of <laughs> bunch of it is not safe to say numb nuts because they're pretty smart they were scientists but there were quite some people who started carrying radioactive stuff in their pocket and eventually faced the consequences so obviously now we are smart enough to not do that but yeah from 1905 to 1945 nothing significant visually happened in terms of nuclear science and engineering so there were there were rumors though that the germans have found out how to make and make a bomb from atomic energy and it all started because otto Hahn was working on the same topic and somewhere close to 1938 he had discovered the atom splitting so if you look at the proper the most basic reaction of how an atom splits it goes like this i'm going to put on the screen as well but it basically goes like this u-235 is going to be bombarded with one neutron and as a result you are going to get barium with atomic number 56 and atomic mass 141 and krypton with atomic number 36 and atomic mass 92 this is what they were seeing this is what they were observing that you bombard neutron into a u30 u235 and you are going to get barium and krypton but they were super confused that what's actually going on but in 1939 they understood it properly and they understood it with a woman named lisa meitner now lisa meitner was working in germany with otto Hahn close to 1930s but then hitler went crazy he said that all jews must be sent to the concentration camp some of them might die a lot of them actually died so lisa meitner being a smart woman she is found out pretty soon that it's time to bounce so she she went to netherlands and uh, there she used to communicate with otto Hahn on the basis of mails not gmail actually written mails not pigeons too but proper males you get the point so Otto Hahn was confused like Lisa what's actually going on over here when I put neutron on uranium it should get heavier how the hell am I getting two lighter atoms that is barium, barium and krypton and in some of these exchanges what she mentioned is maybe what you're actually getting is U-236 and then U-236 being so unstable actually splits into two that is barium and krypton 
And then Otto Man must have said, oh yeah, that makes super duper sense because when we match the atomic number and atomic mass, this is what we are getting. But what about loss of three atomic numbers? And that was the three neutrons that were produced. Might have gone that way, might not have. But this is the whole point. When you're seeing, when you bombard neutron into a uranium-235 and you get barium and krypton, uh, what is actually happening is U-235 turning into U-236, which is very unstable, splits, and then you get barium and krypton and three neutrons. Now these three neutrons, my friends, are extremely dangerous or very helpful. Depends on how you look at it. Depends on how you use it. These three neutrons now will go ahead and hit another U-235 uh, atom or three other atoms, which is again going to create three more neutrons, which is again going to hit three more U-235s. You get the point. It is creating a chain reaction. And that makes atomic energy so devastating or so humongous. So... Now, why, why is this the splitting? Can you just hit, let us say, sodium and will it split? Well, it won't because it is not that unstable. You need heavy atoms so that it splits. Heavy atoms are unstable. You put neutron, it becomes so unstable that it is going to split. So this is the whole thing is called nuclear fission. There's something else called nuclear fusion, which is going on in sun right now where two lighter atoms combine to create a heavier atom and then, more importantly, create a large amount of energy. Now, where does E is equal to mc square comes over here? Now, the loss of mass is present in these reactions and this loss of mass is not going to go anywhere. This loss of mass is going to be converted into energy. But when you look at the reaction, what you see is, uh, let us see, 235 plus 1, okay, 236. On the right-hand side, I see 141 plus 92 plus 3. So I get 236 on the right-hand side as well. So Ashish, there's no deficit of mass. How is there a creation of energy because of conversion of mass? You see, the mass difference is not going to be that humongous. It is always in some fractions. But when you look at what it is multiplied with, that is square of speed of light, it is significant. It is super significant. And that energy is the nuclear energy. And that is because of the atomic bonds. So it is a little bit complicated, but some energy is involved, which now is going to be present. And that energy, in the simplest term, if you think about it, always something. And when that bond is no longer over there, that is going to explode in the form of an energy. This is the simple formula or simple basis of nuclear fission. Now, all of this happened in 1939. Obviously, spies are everywhere. Different countries are putting spies in different countries. Obviously, UK must have had their spies in Germany. US must have had their own. So, everybody knows what's going on. So, America now is terrified, man. Now we look at nuclear energy and think about, hey, nuclear submarines, okay, nuclear propulsion, oh, nuclear power, nuclear reactors. And they think at that time in 1939, atom bomb can be dropped on Pennsylvania and we all might die. So, America started their own project called Project Manhattan, 1942. They first went to Albert Einstein himself. That's a... We need you. You were the one who found it. And let's make you the project director. And you might run a project. The end goal over here is to create an atom bomb. And Albert Einstein said, I want nothing to do with that. That's what he said. I do not want any part of this. <laughs> so he, he personally believed that it is wrong to create bomb using this technology. And he was the father of it all. So he must also be knowing that it is very uncontrollable. And we found it multiple times. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl. We found it in Fukushima. And definitely we found it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So it creates thousands and thousands of people. And uh, sometimes it gets uncontrollable. So... It was right for Einstein to be paranoid. So he said no. And since he was in democratic country, he could have said no. If you were not, oh no, that means that you don't want to do it willingly, but you know that you have to do it. 
So <laughs> Albert Einstein was in a democratic country. So he said no and he walked out. And then the project director was Oppenheimer. He was the one who quoted Bhagavad Gita when it was exploded in Trinity Desert. Uh, desert. What was that quote that he said? I'm going to actually put the actual video because those kind of videos should be a public property. So try to remember it. I am the God, the destruction of all, something like that. Okay. So here, you, here it goes. Listen to exactly what Oppenheimer said. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So he was terrified that the chain reaction might not ever end. And uh, he said to the military team that, hey, I, I don't really know that we should, I think that we should not drop it. And the military said, no longer in your hands, son. Probably, probably what Eisenhower said, no longer in your hands, son, it's mine. Uh, so if you look at the proper history, Franklin D. Roosevelt was the president of United States uh, through the entire war, the major part of it. But before the war ended, he died. He passed away. Actually, if you look at it, he always had health issues to the point that he wasn't able to walk properly, even when he was in the office. But he tried his best to hide it. You can't look weak. Look at Putin, man. You'll see him in judo classes. You'll see him riding horses, all to show that our leader or our president is fine. He's going to be fine for a long time. All right. But anyways, uh, Franklin FDR passed away in the middle of the war and comes Harry Truman in the office. And legend goes that he was having no idea, even being the vice president, he was having no idea that we have Project Manhattan going on. It was a highly secretive project for obvious reasons. This is what they say. Harry Truman had no idea. And if you look at the situation of war at this point, so even the test, I'll put the proper date over here, but the test was after Hitler committed suicide. And the whole, whole idea of Project Manhattan was to, I'm going to drop this on Berlin so that we end the war right away. Even though the Japanese attacked the Pearl Harbor, America always had Europe first principle. For them, the war in Europe was much more important than war in Pacific. Because Europe is such a crossroad of this world, it has always been the most important part. I've discussed this in the last one. So, so after they had the VE day, that is victory in Europe day, only then they started really pushing into Japan. So the whole idea was of Project Manhattan was that they are going to win the war in Germany or win the war in Europe with this atom bomb. Or in the worst case scenario, if Germany develops it first, we are going to have a face off just like we had in Cuban Missile Crisis. So that none of us actually deploys it. So Hitler committed suicide, April 38th, 1945. And then what are you going to do with it? Now, now if you do not know, the Russians were doing pretty fine in World War II by 1945 too. They actually reached Berlin before Americans. And there's a funny story over here. Uh, in, the, in the western part of Berlin, there's a college in which the Americans and the Russians both suspected that the highest level nuclear research is going on over there. And both of their plans were that I'm going to hijack that college and find out what's going on. I'm going to build my own atom bomb. The problem that Stalin faced is that that part of Berlin actually came into the western part. 
So before properly reaching Germany and invading Germany, they had already made pacts. How are we going to split it amongst ourselves? So in that pact, they had said that, okay, this part goes to France and this part goes to United States. This part goes, goes to British. And uh, in Berlin also, this part goes to Russia. And in Berlin also, which was in the Russian part, that is the eastern half of Germany, this part goes to France, this part goes to UK, this part goes to US, and this part goes to Russia, obviously. So there was there was a western part inside the Berlin part, which was inside the eastern part, which was Russian part, okay? So that, that tiny Berlin part, which was of western hands, was having this university where they suspected that nuclear science and technology research is going on and they have figured out atom bomb. Hitler has figured out atom bomb. Uh, but when so so Stalin was having this kind of race that who reaches Berlin first now it is quite interesting how he played it so whenever the West asked that hey Stalin man uh, you want to take Berlin before us because you know we have an understanding right even if you reach over there we are going to split like gentlemen and Stalin says I don't care you want to go over there first that is fine by me then so, Americans say, oh, yeah, I guess that he's going to be cool. But inside, Stalin was thinking, yeah, I'm going to actually get that college and get all the data before the Americans come. So that was his plan. But when he reached over there before the Americans, there was nothing over there. The, the highest technology that Germans created were the V2 rockets. That's it. Uh, but nuclear science was never actually developed by the Germans to the level that they could create atom bombs. So that all went to vain and poor Stalin. Now, <laughs> the Project Manhattan was pretty much a success by May of 1945, where they properly tested it in Trinity Desert. And that boom sounded throughout the world. Everybody now knew what's actually going on. Now, here's the thing. The bomb was created for Germany. Germany lost. The war in Europe is over now. 38th, uh, this Hitler committed suicide and a few days later, there were there was an official surrender, unconditional surrender. Italy had gone out of the picture way before. Mussolini was thrown away. Mussolini was hanged by his legs. His dead body was hanged by his leg and his mistress went the same way. Hitler was terrified that he might see the same fate. So what he did is that he went on his bunker, killed himself, two doses, one cyanide and the second gun to the head. And at the same time, gave orders to Goebbels that burn my body so that I'm not hanged by my legs. And uh, that's what he did, apparently. I don't know. So, so the war in Europe is over. Italy is gone. Germany is gone. The only one left in the Axis power is Japan. So, where to drop it? Where to drop it? Now, here's the thing. This is what we, go, what we call two birds, one stone. So dropping an atom bomb on Japan does two things. Number one, wins the war, obviously. Now, Japanese were brutal. They were dropping straight up their airplanes to their to their ships. Straight up. They called it, what we call it? Eminem made an album on that, kamikaze. Kamikaze attacks, like suicide missions. So, it was brutal. Uh, Okinawa, great problems. They got closer, Japanese fought harder. And they could only imagine what happens when I reach Tokyo. So Iwo Jima was the last, like, oh, okay, okay, let's plant the flag over here and drop the bomb over there. <laughs> so so that's that's what they did. That like, Number one target, okay, I'm going to win the war. Now, here's the thing. Americans could have taken the help of Russians as well. The Russians, you invade from the top, we invade from the bottom, and we take Japan. But then again, Japan would have been divided into North Japan and South Japan, just like Korea. North Korea and South Korea. So that, that was already a problem. Europe was already divided. Now, these democratic countries were not going to trust the communist country of USSR. So what they did is that uh, not going to get Russians involved over there. So a lot of people are going to die. Probably more people than the, than the number that died in the D-Day. So what are we going to do? Now, obviously, this is going to be difficult. But also, we are not going to take conditional surrenders from Japan. So, drop the bomb. And also, at the same time, Russians are going to be scared because of this power. It is going to do dual 
dual job over here by number one eliminating japan without the help of russia and scaring the hell out of stalin so the first bomb was dropped on 6th august 1945 and uh, this did not scare japan at all the hiroshima bombing did not scare japan at all they'll say we are going to fight till the end that is what we do we are samurais it's not going to scare me Three days later, 9th of August, 1945, Nagasaki. Now, here's the thing. Japanese were not scared of it at all. But who was paying attention? Stalin. The day the first bomb was dropped, Stalin invaded the Manchuria parties and said, send the troops. We are not going to wait for Americans to call us. Send the troops. We will take as much as we can. And he sent the troops in the northern part of China, currently. And the second bomb dropped and even the Japanese said, okay, man done unconditional surrender and that was what we call victory in pacific and that's where the war ended now on a technical part even though the nagasaki bomb which is called the fat man code name which was plutonium based was much more powerful compared to the hiroshima bomb which was code name the little boy uh, which was uranium based nagasaki actually caused less damage the 9th of August caused less damage because how much damage atom bomb creates depends on a lot of things. Number one, the geography. So Nagasaki is super mountainous. So it contained the disaster better than what Hiroshima could have done. Now, why Hiroshima and why Nagasaki? Why not Tokyo? Well, number one, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were both military intensive bases. So it had huge amount of military power, obviously had citizens as well, no sanctions for that, but uh, it was targeted because of huge amount of military population over there. But obviously, this is not what you can call like first card I threw, Tokyo. <laughs> That's not work like that because you'll wait for negotiation, right? So Japanese were afraid that they are going to bomb Tokyo very soon, so better quit now. Okay, so that's what happened over there. Little bit of history is important right now. And uh, should we discuss more about that? I think that more about in detail nuclear science we can discuss in the next one where I would like to discuss uh, how nuclear reactors work. Then I want to discuss a few of the failures majorly. I know everybody knows about Chernobyl because you all watched the damn series. I also watched it, loved it, watched it multiple times actually. <laughs> but Fukushima is also very important and we are going to discuss that. The Three Mile Island, not that important, but okay, I'm going to discuss it. It's, it was not a complete failure. Uh, it was it was having meltdown, but it was not a disaster, not like explosions after explosions. So we are going to discuss that later. Maybe I'm going to explain what's actually going on inside Atom Bomb as mm -hmm. well. And uh, then we are going to get into what we really want to get into, that is nuclear propulsion. What is actually going on and how is it doubly efficient than any other propulsion and any other chemical propulsion. Obviously, don't bring dark matter propulsion and all that. Also, if you want some topics to be discussed, do put it down in the comment section. And... Uh, Ultimately, I also want to talk a little bit about nuclear submarines and uh, maybe we can talk about nuclear ballistic missiles as well. Okay, so it depends on you which way you want it to go. But it's not correct to end this podcast without actually answering the community questions. So here goes the community question. Uh, what's his name? Anindya. Okay, Anindya has asked seven questions over here. How a nuclear reactor works? Okay, nuclear reactor works on the same simple equation that we have talked. Obviously, if if chem, if your uh, fissionable material is other than uranium, that is plutonium, plutonium or thorium, then you will have different reactions about which we are going to talk about. But over there, we have a control system. So we have a control rod which will absorb neutrons neutrons if neutrons are too much so there's a ratio that number of neutrons produced by number of neutrons consumed and if it goes greater than one then obviously what we are having is a supercritical reactor that means that it is going in the direction of exploding 
If it is equal to 1, it is called critical reactant and that's how we want nuclear reactors to operate. If it is less than 1, then it is a subcritical reactor and that reactor is going to eventually shut down. So nuclear reactors are critical, atom bomb is super critical, Chernobyl <laughs> 1986, that very uh, day was super critical and same happened with Fukushima in 2011. Uh, but we are going to obviously discuss that in much more detail. Everything will be discussed. Like I said, I, I had much more to discuss, but time flies by or flies by when you're having too much fun. Now, I'm going to discuss a few of these questions over here. What are the applications of robotics in nuclear industry? Uh, in short, I'm going to explain, but in detail, I'm going to explain in the next one. So these plutonium rods or uh, uranium rods, these fuels are mostly in the form of rods or even control rods are not going to be held by hands, obviously, it will burn your hands. So robots are used to place, uh, pick up the used fuel or place the new fuel rod or move up and down these control rods right so robotics are hugely used actually all of these nuclear uh, research centers have a special center for robotics it has huge applications okay what are some of the unknown scientific facts about nuclear industry hmm. some of them i already discussed the history of it that dark history of it the nuclear science and engineering itself was not created to create power but it was created to destroy things but thankfully humans understood a better way to do it now uh, a very less known part about nuclear science is that it is extremely safe and also it kills less number of people in total it is much safer than uh, these fossil fuels like uh, hydro power plants or uh, thermal power plants that we use so I'm going to discuss that later. But as you can see, Germany is going to shut down all of its nuclear reactors. So maybe it is already shut down. Let me know down in the comment section. But it is definitely going to shut down all the nuclear reactors because the people over there are terrified. God damn it. So you did not do any research. Hmm. God damn it. Anyways, so it is safer than people think. That would be one of the unknown scientific facts. <laughs> Tragically. Okay. What are the future applications of nuclear energy in our country? See, our country wants to become self-sufficient when it comes to nuclear energy. We all know that fossil fuels are going to wipe away. Now, India does not have uranium, a lot of it. it does not have uranium reserves. What it has is a lot of thorium. Now, some of you guys might be knowing because of Pokhran tests, India has been facing a lot of sanctions when it comes to import of uh, nuclear materials right so india can't really import nuclear material from abroad even if it is just for the say for power production so what the plan homi baba launched back in 1950s and 60s itself is that we will ultimately get into thorium based reactors so that is the way the india is uh, the country of india is going when it comes to power production now, don't ask related to military because nobody knows. What did I tell you in the beginning of the podcast? Nobody knows. And people who knows and talks about it, mm, not a wise thing to do. <laughs> All right. Can we really extract the nuclear fuel from different planets and stars? Well, that's a very hypothetical and fictional question. First, you'll have to find it. But dude, just think about it the resources that you are going to find on Mars. It's like multiply it by two. So the, the person who is going to find a landing and civilization on Mars is not only going to get a cooler view at Earth, but also is going to get a bunch of tons of resources. So some of these things are not discussed that much when they are talking about SpaceX's plan to civilize Mars. So definitely other celestial bodies. If you can actually uh, inhabit a celestial body, even if it does not have any oxygen, something for you to inhabit that planet like comfortably, like sipping coffee, like a gentleman while taking the gaze at 
three moons that you can look at it uh it is still very beneficial when it comes to resources but you'll have to invest like doing the drillings over there it's going to be quite expensive but then again sometimes a little bit of expenses are important now i'm not sure about it i heard it somewhere uh, but the cost of project manhattan was close to two billion dollars like i said i'm not sure the number might be very high some even say that might be in trillions but what i heard isn't it was two two billion dollars now even if it is trillions think about the return that it brings it made united states the superpower that it is today how many billions and trillions did it earn because of that so some investment is important can you really extract uh, okay why there is no private companies in india who are using nuclear fuel to generate electricity unlike usa and russia that honestly i do not know much but obviously the obvious reasons would be our government will be taking actions step by step okay so you <laughs> that that book i was i always end up talking about that is ready to fire because it is a fantastic book to understand the history of space program in india so over there nambi narayan has talked about the fact that when russia was created creating tons like 60 ton of propulsion at that time india was creating somewhere around 60 kg or 600 kg of propulsion so our program is behind we all know that and we can't really expect things to go at the pace that russia is going or united states are going like we did not capture nazis to start our space program did we they already knew the v2 rocket uh that the level that they are at we can't really compare man when they had got the when when they had got what, what's his name when they got von braun at that time india was a colonized country what are you talking about son you can't really compare these countries india got its freedom how many years is it uh it's 50 72 yeah 75 years got 75 years ago United States got its got its freedom in 1700s the late 1700s so you can now calculate yourself like 200 years god damn it can't really compare so everything every process will take its time okay so even russia is fairly fairly new it was russia got its uh, proper revolution in 1922 so it's fairly new uh, it is 100 years old united states is double that old UK or France if you look at it they have been going on for a millennium they have been ruling the world for a millennium so can't really compare those so that's why it will take its time you can already see that space industry is highly privatized nowadays okay we are seeing agnikul we are seeing skyroot there are like hundreds of different satellite companies right now in bangalore so it's only a matter of time sir Okay, if you're behind, you're probably going to make it much faster. Why there is no okay? That's the on that's the question already answered. Can India make any kind of advanced nuclear weapon in near future? Advanced meaning what? So there are a lot of definitions of advanced. India already has nuclear weapons, but I'm sure they are working on it. You know what I'm more sure about? I am not going to find out what they are working about. Okay, neither are you. Stop trying to crack engineering semester examinations and talk about the weapons that a country is creating. <laughs> It's out of jurisdiction. It is confidential. You can find out. All right, guys. Thank you for being over here. I hope that you enjoyed. Space cast is now regular. Why? I made a lot of money, son. I made a lot of money, and now I can spend time talking about what I want to talk about. I don't have to get paid. I'll get five hundred views, and I'll be happy. Only people have to be enthusiastic over here. That's about it, guys. I'll see all of you in the next one. Do like, comment, subscribe, and share to help the podcast grow. And I'll see all of you in the next one. Till then, bye.